Let's begin. Welcome to class number one of a course on Gnosticism and early Christianity. As you've uh, probably learned from the assignment sheets, uh, the chief texts that I recommend uh, are one, Hans Jonas, the Gnostic religion, which I think is the best available uh, concise text that we have in, in English for Gnosticism, and Henry Chadwick's uh, The Early Church. Now, for those wanting to uh, go into more depth, I would suggest that you consult the uh, material in the 10 volume set of the Anti Nicene Fathers. You can find that in the library. Also, Mead's Fragments of a Faith Forgotten uh, provides uh, a kind of epitome of the various relevant texts uh, from, from, the, uh, from the early uh, uh, church fathers, both concerning Gnosticism and, and concerning early Christianity. I'd also like to mention uh, an alternative check, uh, text to Chadwick's uh, by the same title. It's also called The Early Church by W.H.C. Friend. This is uh, less structured than Chadwick and not not as comprehensive, but it's easier reading. He has a livelier style, and uh, uh, it's, uh, it's got a little more spark to it. Now, what I intend to do is to, uh, for each session, to speak for about an hour, and uh, in our main, remaining time, take up uh, whatever questions may come to me. Uh, I shall not take questions from the floor this time, but I will take them in writing. So if you have a question, please note it as, as you go along. Submit it concisely in writing, either at the end of a given session, or if you wish, you can mail it to me. And if I uh, feel I have something to say to the question, I'll respond to it uh, in our next session. It's also an opportunity to do it anonymously. Okay, to get into the heart of the matter then. For those of you who've uh, looked into Jung's work, Ion, if you'd reflected on it, uh, you might very well have realized, as, as I have, that uh, this book, Ion, has laid the foundation for a whole new discipline of study. Uh, if I were to label a new discipline, I would call it uh, archetypal psychohistory. Uh, it's a study that perceives and elaborates the movements of the collective unconscious as they manifest themselves through the political and cultural history of the human race. Uh, the requirement being, though, that first you have to see those movements. In other words, you have to perceive them at the depth level from which they're happening. Uh, I really believe this is an important discipline of the future. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to offer you in the next uh, 12 sessions is a kind of initial effort uh, in this uh, new discipline of archetypal psychohistory. You know, about 2,000 years ago, the collective psyche 
was undergoing a profound upheaval that has uh, remarkable parallels to what's happening again in our own time. Uh, and this upheaval amounted to the, to the death and rebirth of the functioning God image of that time. And something of the same sort of thing is happening today. That, that same drama is repeating itself. And what happened at that time was that that, that great historical drama played itself out uh, largely as a confrontation between uh, two major uh, antagonists or protagonists, uh, Rome and Judea. And to start with, I want to say something about each of those protagonists in turn as to just what their condition was at the beginning of, of our era. Uh, let's start with Rome. After decades of, of destructive and demoralizing civil war uh, that destroyed the Roman Republic, uh, the uh, Roman state was was uh, restabilized uh, as the Roman Empire, uh, at least temporarily, by resorting to absolutist rule. Uh, the rule carried out by a deified emperor, and the civic virtue of the republic uh, was replaced more and more <clears throat> by the motives of pure greed and power. And the earlier authentic devotion to the Roman gods and to the genuine patriotic service to Rome that was so characteristic of the, of the noble Romans of the Republic, uh, that was lost in the empire. And the religious motives uh, that uh, prevailed in the people were perverted more and more by the state to serve uh, the personal power purposes of the leaders of the, of the uh, empire. Even Rome's famous toleration of all religions was a kind of cynical power ploy. Uh, according to Gibbon's uh, famous remark, he, he said, quote, the various modes of worship which prevailed in the Roman world were all considered by the people as equally true, by the philosopher as equally false, and by the magistrate as equally useful. Uh, I doubt that the common people were quite as tolerant as Gibbon allowed them to be. But anyway, so far as the ruling class was concerned, cynicism in regard to religion prevailed. And in addition to that, there was the morally corrosive effects of, uh, of universal slavery, uh, which went almost entirely unchal unchallenged, even by the wisest men of the day. Here's what Jung has to say about uh, ancient Rome. Uh, this comes from uh, volume 5, paragraph 104. He says, the men of the, <clears throat> we can hardly realize the whirlwinds of brutality and unchained libido that roared through the streets of imperial Rome. The men of that age were ripe for identification with the word made flesh, for the founding of a community united by an idea in the name of which they could love one another and call each other brothers. There was an elementary need in the great masses of humanity vegetating in spiritual darkness. They were evidently driven to it by the profoundest inner necessities, for humanity does not thrive in a state of licentiousness. So that was Rome at uh, the beginning of our inquiry. Now how about Judea? This was a tiny province in the vast Roman Empire 
that had just what Rome lacked, namely a profound, authentic religiosity that governed its actual life. And this religiosity was rooted in a long historical and prophetic tradition that was enshrined in their holy scriptures. Its deficiency from the standpoint of humanity as a whole was that it was a concrete, local, and highly particularistic religion. The Jews had a relation to Yahweh that was reserved solely for them. This gave them an inner spiritual autonomy that allowed them to stand up to the mighty Roman Empire in, in what's really an astonishing way when you look back at it. But it also set them apart and generated animosity from all sides because of their spiritual arrogance. But they weren't, uh, they weren't in a state of uh, psychic stability either because the, the religious tradition in Judea was also undergoing great upheaval. Uh, just on the political level, the, this proud people was chafing under harsh Roman rule. Uh, also, the priestly religion of, of animal sacrifice and strict literal adherence to the Mosaic law was being questioned uh, from various quarters. As early as Jeremiah, we hear about a so-called new covenant that would be different from the old covenant uh, with Yahweh. And when that new covenant came, he will put... Uh, put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts, as Jeremiah said. In addition to this, a new archetypal image was erupting in the Jewish psyche. The, the Yahweh God image was very much uh, pertaining to the Father. Yahweh was father. But uh, starting a, f a few hundred years uh, before the new era, we find a new image emerging, the image of the sun, alternatively called either the son of God or the son of man. Now, from the very beginning of the Jewish scriptures, uh, Yahweh had designated Israel, the collective national entity, as his son. However, this new formulation uh, was putting it differently. It was, uh, it was uh, uh, bringing forth an, a new version of the son, uh, of a different and more specific nature than the collective sonship of Israel as a whole. Uh, Jung discusses this matter in answer to Job, you may recall. Uh, there he, he speaks of the effects of Yahweh's encounter with, with Job. Because of that encounter and because of the consciousness of Yahweh's nature that Job acquired, uh, Yahweh was therefore obliged to incarnate himself and to become man. And Jung demonstrates that this uh, tendency reveals itself successively, uh, first of all in Ezekiel and the great uh, vision of Ezekiel, then again in the book of Daniel, and then uh, in the book of Enoch. And in, in all of these uh, sources, <clears throat> the term son of man took on considerable prom prominence. Ezekiel was, was called by Yahweh the son of man. And uh, in the book of Daniel, uh, there is reference to the son of man. And in the book of Enoch, 
uh, Enoch a number of times is specifically uh, designated as son of man. Jesus certainly knew the book of Enoch. Jung, uh, Jung's convinced of that. And uh, he appropriated that term, son of man, to apply to himself. He probably got it from Enoch among, along with the other sources. Um, this is a very interesting symbolic image, the image of, of the son of man. Uh, I, uh, I talk about it uh, in my book, Transformation of the God Image, you can so you can find it uh, on page ninety. Uh, I won't repeat myself now, but the basic idea is uh, that the Son of Man, as as it's been elaborated, and it's it's gotten an immense amount of scrutiny by religious scholars. It's, uh, it's an image that fascinates them, uh, which is characteristic of a living symbol. When you've got a really living symbol, it has a fascinating effect, and uh, uh, scholars and commentators cluster around it like moths around a flame. Uh, and that's certainly what's happened with this, uh, uh, with this term. I have a whole, whole book at home titled The Son of Man, just on this subject. Um, basically, the uh, the way it's understood is, uh, falls into two categories. One category is uh, is just the personal re reductive uh, category. It doesn't mean anything special. It just means you were born of a woman, and it just means about the same thing as man. It's cold outside. Uh, doesn't mean anything more than that. But the context of of uh, of these uh, passages uh, belie that uh, that that simple explanation, and uh, uh, the the other view uh, I think we uh, have to take very seriously that it uh, is definitely a messianic and eschatological term and refers to the, to an entity that derives from the transpersonal uh, divine uh, dimension. And the, the fact that uh, the terms son of God and son of man are often interchangeable uh, especially in the gospel accounts uh, is quite understandable to Jungian psychologists who are acquainted with the fact that uh, individuation proceeds uh, from a twofold source, namely uh, from two centers, namely from, from both the self and the ego. Uh, and uh, since that's the case, this, this double aspect of the term son of man uh, is quite consistent with the psychological findings. So this son of man figure was em emerging in the uh, in the Jewish psyche for two or three centuries uh, in advance of the time we're examining, and this this same figure had other uh, uh, terminology attached to it. Uh, it was also called uh, Messiah, Anointed King. And Christ, those three, those three words are synonyms. They mean exactly the same thing. Uh, Christos is is only the Greek uh, term for anointed. One is anointed by chrism. You see, it's the same. It's the same root word, and Messiah means the anointed one. So. Uh, the the basic idea that is that the Son of Man uh, is coming as the Anointed One, and the idea is that he was conceived 
as being sent by God to bring salvation to mankind and to function as a mediator between God and humanity, which was in danger of losing its connection to the divine. And as, as this figure uh, was, was elaborated in the, uh, in the scriptures, it took on a double aspect. In one aspect, it was described as a suffering servant. Uh, suffering, unjust suffering, willingly accepted uh, in order to redeem mankind from sin. Uh, the 53rd chapter of Isaiah is the classic statement for that aspect of the Messiah. Its other aspect is as triumphant king coming in judgment, defeating Israel's enemies and bringing judgment and a perpetual reign of, of righteousness. Uh, one, one good source for a description of that version of the image is Psalms number 2. And by and large, uh, the, the Jews were expecting a concrete, literal version of the second type. And it's largely for that reason that they refused to accept Jesus with his humiliating execution and apparently uh, total life failure. Now, according to Josephus, there were four competing schools or sects among the Jews at the time of uh, Christ. There were the Sadducees uh, that were the establishment that, and uh, composed the, of the, the temple priesthood largely. They were the practical ones and they did not indulge in any theological fantasy uh, or elaboration of uh, uh, of doctrines such as destiny or resurrection. There were the Pharisees who were much more theologians. They were more imaginative, more thoughtful, and uh, they uh, uh, more introverted, I guess you could say. And they, they did indulge in some of these theological fantasies, and they, they believed in, re in resurrection and in uh, uh, destiny. Uh, neither of those were particularly influenced by the uh, by the emerging Messiah image. They were too uh, too rooted in the in the mainstream daily functioning, I think, for that. But the other two uh, sects were very much gripped by the emerging Messiah archetype, uh, namely the the Essenes and the Zealots. The, the zealots were revolutionaries and, and arsonists who were seeking to expel Rome uh, by military means and uh, expecting the coming of a political messiah who would, would quite literally free them from Roman rule and, and reestablish the, uh, the monarchy of, of Israel. Uh, they were definitely gripped by the Messiah archetype in a very concrete sense. The, uh, the other sect, the, the Essenes, uh, were the, the sect of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And they are particularly interesting from our standpoint. They had been very much gripped by the erupting Messiah archetype. And uh, they had separated themselves from the, from the Jerusalem priesthood uh, and uh, moved to the desert and lived a monastic life uh, awaiting the, the Messiah. Uh, and uh, it was this uh, eschatological expectation that, that governed their whole daily life, uh, really. Uh, so that 
they're a quite striking example of uh, uh, a group being gripped by the emerging uh, Messiah archetype. However, the fact remains that this emerging archetype revealed its fullest expression and its most enduring effects in the life of, of Jesus Christ and in the community that crystallized around his figure uh, after his death. In another place, I summarize, summarize the, the bare bones of, of the myth of, of Christ that uh, emerged uh, in the centuries uh, after his death. Let me repeat that. Uh, this comes from page 16 of the Christian archetype. The, the gist of the myth is this. God's pre-existent, only begotten Son empties himself of his divinity and is incarnated as a man through the agency of the Holy Ghost who impregnates the Virgin Mary. He is born in humble surroundings, accompanied by numerous events, and survives grave initial dangers. When he reaches adulthood, he submits to baptism by John the Baptist and witnesses the descent of the Holy Ghost, signifying his vocation. He survives temptation by the devil and fulfills his ministry, which proclaims a benevolent, loving God and announces the coming of the kingdom of heaven. After agonizing uncertainty, he accepts his destined fate and allows himself to be arrested, tried, flagellated, mocked, and crucified. After three days in the tomb, according to many witnesses, he is resurrected. For 40 days, he walks and talks with his disciples and then ascends to heaven. Ten days later, at Pentecost, the Holy Ghost descends, the promised paraclete. Now, when we examine uh, the records we have about the, this figure of Jesus, it quickly becomes evident that uh, the personal story of the individual is so interpenetrated by the description of the archetypal role projected onto him that it's impossible to, ex uh, to separate the historical Jesus from the mythological figure. They're, they're, they're so interpenetrated. Now, we've got a very interesting letter of Jung's on this subject that I want to read to you in, in part. Upton Sinclair had written a, uh, a Life of Jesus and sent it to Jung for, for his uh, comments. And Jung responded to him uh, with a quite lengthy letter which we're very fortunate to have. Uh, Sinclair, uh, I haven't read the book actually, but it's clear from Jung's letter that uh, he largely treated uh, Jesus just in his personal human aspect. So gave him pretty much of a reductive uh, uh, account. Now here's what Jung has to say uh, on, on that subject. This comes from uh, uh, volume two of the letters uh, starting on page 201. If Jesus had indeed been nothing but a great teacher hopelessly mistaken in his messianic expectations, we should be at complete loss in understanding his historical effect. If, on the other hand, we cannot understand by rational means what a God-man is, then we don't know what the New Testament is all about. But it would be just our task to understand what, what they meant by a God-man. You give an excellent picture of a possible religious teacher, 
but you give us no understanding of what the New Testament tries to tell, namely, the life, fate, and effect of a God-man. In other words, of the archetype. These are the reasons why I should propose to deal with, with the Christian Ur phenomenon in a somewhat different way. I think we ought to admit that we don't understand the riddle of the New Testament. With our present means, we cannot unravel a rational story from it unless we interfere with the text. If we take this risk, we can read various stories into the text and give them a certain amount of probability. And he then makes three suggestions. One. Jesus is an idealistic religious teacher of great wisdom who knows that his teaching would make the necessary impression only if he were willing to sacrifice his life for it. Thus he forces the issue in complete foreknowledge of the facts which he intends to happen. 2. Jesus is a highly strong, forceful personality, forever at variance with his surroundings, and possessed of a terrific will to power. Yet, being of superior intelligence, he perceives that it would not do to assert it on the worldly plane of political sedition as so many similar zealots in his days had done. He had rather uh, preferred the role of the old prophet and reformer of his people, and he institutes a spiritual kingdom instead of an unsuccessful political rebellion. For this purpose, he adopts not only the messianic Old Testament expectations, but also the then popular son of man figure in the book of Enoch. But meddling with the political whirlpool in Jerusalem, he gets himself caught in its intrigues and meets a tragic end with a full recognition of his failure. Third possibility, Jesus is an incarnation of the Father God. As a God-man, he walks the earth drawing to himself the, the elect or the chosen of his Father announcing the message of universal salvation and being mostly understood. As the crowning of his short career, he performs a supreme sacrifice in offering himself up as the perfect host and thus redeems mankind from eternal uh, perdition. That's as much as I'm going to read, but... Uh, it's evident from what he says and also from a later quote that I'm going to read you that um, so far as the understanding of the historical Jesus is concerned, uh, Jung subscribes to item number two. Item number three, of course, is just a picture of the archetype. What we have, then, is that the life of Christ becomes a, as, as it comes down to us, becomes a symbolic picture of two separate superimposed events. In one event, the Son of God descends to earth to incarnate as man, and in the second event, the human being engages the archetype of the God image and finds himself caught up in embodying it. So putting that those two psychologically, we could say in the first place the self enters the ego, and in the second place the the ego becomes conscious of and related to the self. Now this is the event that, that happened in the collective psyche 2,000 years ago. Uh, so far as the Jewish psyche was concerned, uh, the Christian sect that was generated around the figure of Jesus uh, was a her heresy that was eventually extirpated. But in the case of the classical psyche, the Greco-Roman 
psyche. Uh, the consequences were immense. See, it's obvious that the classical psyche needed what the new God image had to offer much more than the Jewish psyche did, because uh, that's how you you tell what a need is by uh, by the thirst. The classical psyche, in its decadence, was based on the principles of pleasure and power, matter, money, and the deified power of the state residing in the hands of the deified emperors who delegated, delegated portions of their arbitrary power to their favorites. And the Christ figure uh, that was constellated <coughs> generated the opposite pole uh, in the collective psyche, namely the spiritual, otherworldly dimension of existence. And that was that was what was missing in the in the classical soul. As Jung puts it, the emergence of Christianity itself signifies the collapse and sacrifice of the cultural values of antiquity, that is, of the classical attitude. That's from volume six, paragraph thirty. He then sums sums it up again uh, in volume 17, paragraph 309. Uh, quite a remarkable observation expressed here. He says this, one of the most shining examples of the meaning of personality that history has preserved for us is the life of Christ. In Christianity, which, be it mentioned in passing, was the only religion really persecuted by the Romans, there rose up a direct opponent of the Caesarian madness that afflicted not only the emperor, but every Roman as well. The opposition showed itself wherever the worship of Caesar clashed with Christianity. But as we know from what the evangelists tell us about the psychic development of Christ's personality, this opposition was fought out just as decisively in the soul of its founder. Here's the striking insight. The story of the temptation clearly reveals the nature of the psychic power with which Jesus came into collision. It was the power-intoxicated devil of the prevailing Caesarean psychology that led him into dire temptation in the wilderness. This devil was the objective psyche that held all the peoples of the Roman Empire under its sway, and that is why it promised Jesus all the kingdoms of the earth, as if it were trying to make a Caesar of him. Obeying the inner call of his vocation, Jesus voluntarily exposed himself to the assaults of the imperialistic madness that filled everyone, conqueror and conquered alike. In this way, he recognized the nature of the object of psyche, which had plunged the whole world into misery, and begotten a yearning for salvation that found expression even in the pagan poets. Far from suppressing or allowing himself to be suppressed by this psychic onslaught, he let it act on him consciously and assimilated it. Here's the, here's the punchline. Thus was world-conquering Caesarism transformed into spiritual kingship and the Roman Empire into the universal kingdom of God that was not of this world. While the whole Jewish nation was expecting an imperialistic-minded and politically active hero as a messiah, Jesus fulfilled the messianic mission not so much for his own nation as for the whole Roman world and pointed out the hum to humanity the old truth that where force rules, there is no love, and where love reigns, force does not count. The religion of love was the exact psychological counterpart to the Roman devil worship of power. Now he takes up the same theme uh, in a 
in another letter. This comes from volume one of the letters, page 267. He says this, Take the classic case of the temptation of Christ, for example. We say that the devil tempted him, but we could just as well say that an unconscious desire for power confronted him in the form of the devil. Both sides appear here, the light and the dark. The devil wants to tempt Jesus to proclaim himself master of the world. Jesus wants not to succumb to the temptation. Then, thanks to the function that results from every conflict, the transcendent function, a symbol appears. It is the idea of the kingdom of heaven, a spiritual kingdom rather than a material one. Two things are united in this symbol, the spiritual attitude of Christ and the devilish desire for power. Thus, the encounter of Christ with the devil is a classic example of the transcendent function. Now, since this is so important in my mind, I'm going to give you yet a third quotation on Jung's view of the historical Jesus. In this one, he puts it more candidly still to a small informal gathering in New York City in 1937. And you will find this in C.G. Jung speaking, starting on page 97. Jesus, you know, was a boy born of an unmarried mother. Such a boy is called illegitimate, and there is a prejudice which puts him at a great disadvantage. He suffers from a terrible feeling of inferiority for which he is certain to have to compensate. Hence the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness in which the kingdom was offered to him. Here he met his worst enemy, the power devil. But he was able to see that. And to refuse. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. But kingdom it was all the same. And you remember that strange incident, the triumphal entry in Jerusalem. The utter failure came at the crucifixion in the tragic words, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? If you want to understand the full tragedy of those words, you must realize what they meant. Christ saw that his whole life, devoted to the truth, according to his best conviction, had been a terrible illusion. He had lived it to the full, absolutely sincerely. He had made his honest experiment, but it was nevertheless a compensation. On the cross, his mission deserted him. But because he had lived so fully and devotedly, he won through to the resurrection body. Now, I'm not going to explore that last mysterious sentence. Now, this all describes the personal, human, uh, ego aspect of the image of Jesus Christ. But the other side, the, trans the transpersonal aspect, equates Christ with the supreme deity, one of the three persons of the Trinity, the divine Logos that exi has existed from all eternity and is co-regent with God. So you can see here, what we have here is a profoundly paradoxical symbolic image. Two natures united in a single individual. Human, and, uh, both human and divine. Origen, whom we are going to talk about uh, later in the course, describes this uh, state of affairs rather colorfully, writing about 200 years after Christ. Let me read you how, how he describes it.
but of all the marvelous and mighty acts related of him, that is God. This altogether surpasses human admiration and is beyond the power of mortal frailness to understand or feel. How that mighty power of divine majesty, that very word of the Father, and that very wisdom of God, in which were created all things, visible and invisible, can be believed to have existed within the limits of that man who appeared in Judea. Nay, that the wisdom of God can have entered the womb of a woman, and have been born an infant, and have uttered wailings like the cries of little children, and that afterwards it should be related that he was greatly troubled in death, saying, My soul is sorrowful even unto death, and that at last he was brought to that death which is accounted the most shameful among men, although he rose again on the third day. Since then we see in him some things so human that they appear differ in no respect from the common frailty of mortals, and some things so defined that they can appropriately belong to nothing else than the primal and ineffable nature of deity. The narrowness of human understanding can find no outlet for this, but overcome with the amazement of a mighty admiration knows not whither to draw or what to take hold of or whither to turn. If it think of a god, it sees a mortal. If it think of man, it beholds him returning from the grave after overthrowing the empire of death laden with its spoils. And therefore the spectacle is to be contemplated with all fear and reverence, that the truth of both natures may be clearly shown to exist in one and the same being, so that nothing unworthy or unbecoming may be perceived in that divine and inevitable substance. Nor yet those things which were done be supposed to be the illusions of imaginary appearances. To utter these things in human ears and to explain them in words far surpasses the power either of our rank or of our intellect and language. I think that it surpasses the power even of the holy apostles. Nay, the explanation of that mystery may perhaps be on the grasp <coughs> of the entire creation of celestial powers. This gives you a little sense of the numinosity that surrounded the paradoxical image of Christ in the early years of, of our era. See, he was an embodiment of the numinosa. He was it. Now, as I said, this paradoxical fig figure uh, has these various names attached to it. Son of God, Son of Man, Messiah, Anointed King, Christ, Suffering Servant, and Stern Judge of the Last Judgment. Now we have to ask ourselves, how is this figure to be understood psychologically by the modern mind? And Jung has given the definitive and epoch-making answer to that question. He first stated it in 1941 in his essay, A Psychological Approach to the Dogma of the Trinity. And here he states that the figure of Christ is an archetype, and specifically the archetype of the self. Here's what he has to say. This is paragraph uh, 231, volume 11. It was this archetype of the self in the soul of every man that responded to the Christian methods, with the result that the concrete Rabbi Jesus was rapidly assimilated by the constellated archetype. In this way, Christ realized the idea of the self. But as one can never distinguish empirically between a symbol of the self and a God image, Two ideas, however much we try to differentiate them, always appear blended together, so that the self appears synonymous with the inner Christ of the Johannine and Pauline writings, and Christ with God, of one substance with the Father, just as the Atman appears as the individualized self and at the same time as the animating principle of the cosmos and Tao as a condition of mind, at the same time as the correct behavior of cosmic events. 
Psychologically speaking, the domain of gods begins where consciousness leaves off, for at that point man is already at the mercy of the natural order, whether he thrive or, per or perish. And then again, in paragraph 233, The goal of psychological as of biological development is self-realization or individuation. But the, since man knows himself only as an ego and the self as a totality, then that is indescribable and indistinguishable from a God image, self-realization. This amounts to God's incarnation. That is already expressed in the fact that Christ is the Son of God. And because individuation is an heroic and often tragic task, the most difficult of all, it involves suffering, a passion of the ego. Moving down a bit, the human and the divine suffering set up a relationship of complementarity with compensating effects. This is the complementarity between the self and the ego. Through the Christ symbol, man can get to know the real meaning of the ego's suffering. He's on the way towards realizing his soulness, his wholeness. As a result of the integration of conscious and unconscious, his ego enters the divine, in quotes, realm, where it participates in God's suffering. The cause of the suffering is in both cases the same, namely incarnation. which on the human level appears as individuation. The divine hero born of man is already threatened with murder. He has nowhere to lay his head and his death is a gruesome tragedy. The self is no mere concept or logical postulate. It's a psychic reality, only part of it conscious, while the, for, for the rest it embraces the life of the unconscious and is therefore inconceivable except in the form of symbols. The drama of the archetypal life of Christ describes in symbolic images the events in the conscious life, as well as in the life that transcends consciousness, of a man who has been transformed by his higher destiny. Now this discovery of Jung uh, I think it's impossible to overemphasize the significance of it. Some uh, discovery that can be summed up in, in one lapidary sentence. Christ is a symbol of the self. Providing you grasp fully what's meant by those words. But once one truly understands the meaning of that concise sentence, the whole conflict of our age between scientific secular humanism and traditional religion is resolved. In one stroke, traditional Christianity has been redeemed from irrelevance for the modern mind. The whole vast body of Christian dogma, disputation, commentary, heresy, and so on, extending for 20 centuries, can now be understood as the painful, tortuous workings of the collective unconscious on humanity as it strives to bring the divine drama of the evolving God image into human consciousness. Now, what happened... Two thousand years ago, with the uh, eruption of the Christ archetype into collective consciousness, set off a chain of events that led to a whole new eon. The eon we are just uh, closing now. It provoked a huge process. Uh, in the collective psyche uh, that split into two main streams. 
in the first stream, uh, the development of the Christian church proceeded, which through uh, various twists and turns and uh, dead ends, finally developed into a single, unified, uh, universal Catholic orthodoxy. It took several centuries to do it. Um, and the, the fruit of that development then was the institution of the church that was really the uh, chrysalis of Western civilization as we as we know it, because it was it was out of that cocoon that uh, Western civilization was uh, was born. It survived the uh, the Dark Ages and passed much of uh, of uh, of the uh, works of antiquity. Onto the to the modern world, uh, its hallmark was a unified, universal. That's what Catholic means. It means universal, uh, coherent, uniform, collective belief structure that was. Uh, build into an institu institutional framework that could that was strong enough to withstand uh, many many severe political storms through the, through the century. Uh, but the fundamentally, it was a collective phenomenon, and what grew out of it was a, a society, a collective civilization. The other stream is the stream of uh, Gnosticism. Uh, in contrast to the churchly stream, right from the beginning, it fragmented into a multitude of various uh, sects and, and proponents. It was uh, much more individualistic than the church stream was. Uh, in that respect, it, to some extent, it foreshadowed the Protestant movement of the, uh, of the 15th and 16th centuries. Uh, so the individualism of Gnosticism uh, fed the, the rich uh, theological and cosmological fantasies that were characteristic of the Gnostic movement, but they had to stem from individuals, and once you let individuals indulge in depth fantasies of that sort, uh, you can forget about orthodoxy, you see. Uh, the church had the good sense, since it, it really knew what it was doing, uh, it was uh, it was creating a durable collective, and uh, in order to do that, it had to uh, very rigorously uh, interdict uh, individual uh, theological fantasy. Uh, and uh, although we we regret uh, in in the modern world uh, any residue of that uh, uh, tendency on the part of the church. It was a vital necessity at, at the time to, uh, to perform the historical function that was in store for it. But the, the Gnostics had, uh, had no such qualms. And what we see then is uh, a, a, a flowering and a dispersal of uh, sex uh, which 
on the one hand was their was their glory, but on the other hand was their downfall because uh, uh, they they sprung up and 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 withered. They didn't gather sufficient critical mass to uh, to form a a durable ongoing tradition. Not to mention the fact that they couldn't stand up against the uh, the collective mass of the church as it crystallized uh, itself out. Now these two streams, the church stream and the Gnostic stream, are represented right at the uh, beginning of their history by two major figures, namely Paul of Tarsus and Simon Magus of Samaria. And what I intend to do in our succeeding sessions uh, is to uh, focus on these two main figures, first of all, and then their descendants. So that next time I'm going to talk about Paul, and in session number three we'll talk about Simon Magus. And then in subsequent sessions we'll uh, follow intermittently and alternately more or less the, the two streams that stem from those figures. So far as the church stream is concerned, after Paul, we'll examine Clement of Alexandria, Origen, Tertullian, and Augustine. And for the Gnostic stream, after Simon Magnus, we'll look at Marcion, Phosphilides, Valentinus, and Mani. And then at the end of that, We'll have one uh, concluding session involving a, a summary of, of where we've been and a look into how things unfolded in the later developments leading up to the current time. Now, as I said, uh, I'm not going to... Uh, take questions from the floor. I think the, the weight of the subject matter dictates this other approach. It's a little more thoughtful way of, of taking questions. But I am available to receive your written questions uh, either here or through the mail, and we'll take up which ones I feel able to at the, at the next session. So with that, I'll say good night.